Well, let's open God's Word now to 1 Timothy chapter 6. As we continue our study in this letter from the Apostle Paul to Timothy, his son in the faith, instructing him on how to put things into order within the church, we've, we've come to this portion where he's talking about the various relationships in the church, and he's going to hone in on a very key component for us today, something that speaks very particularly to the struggles and temptations that we face in a very materialistic world. And the, the battle in our hearts is over the covetousness that is so common and true Christian contentment. And we see that in this passage. I'm going to begin reading in verse 6, so if you would just follow along with me. Paul says to Timothy, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we had food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. This is God's Word. Would you pray with me before we study it together? Father, I do thank you for your Word. I thank you for the opportunity to gather and to hear your Word read and explained and taught, preached and sung. And I pray that you would accomplish your purpose in our hearts today, that you would lay bare your truth in such a way that it would pierce us and change us and convince us of the truth and how to follow in that truth and to repent of the temptations and the struggles that are very common to us as American people. Lord, I pray that you would allow the gospel to be not only continually sung and heard, but also proclaimed in a way that it would be a seed planted in fertile soil, that it would bear fruit for your glory and for the salvation of your people. And Lord, we ask that you would accomplish all of this. Convict us where we need to be convicted. Comfort us where we need to be confront, uh, comforted. And Father, guide us as your people so that we can be faithful and know what is the goal of life. Godliness with contentment. So help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1973, there was a British rock band by the name of Pink Floyd that released an album titled The Dark Side of the Moon, which went on to sell a little over 34 million copies. And in America, the first song from this album to become a top 10 hit was titled Money. Some of y'all may know that song, maybe you don't. There was one line in the song that is a paraphrase of 1 Timothy 6.10, but the band left off a few key words. Here's what they sing. They sing it this way. Money, so they say, is the root of all evil today. The, the song was written by Roger Waters. He, he wrote the song in an attempt to criticize the power of money in Western society and to criticize the dangers of capitalism. And ironically, they made millions off of that song. But they actually got it wrong. Money is not the root of all evil today. Paul makes very clear in this text, it is the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. Like so many of God's gifts, money isn't the real problem. The human heart is the real problem. Because in our hearts, in our sinful hearts, we can make an idol out of anything. And the result is that our lives and our culture is just absolutely filled with idols. The Bible helps us to understand that this occurs because the human heart bent by sin is like an idol factory. In our hearts, we can take the good things that God has given us and we can deify them making them the center of our lives, and we look to these things for our significance and for our comfort and for our purpose in life. And when we've done that, we've made an idol out of a thing. 
And we look to our heart idols for security and for joy and even for salvation. But the scriptures make very clear to us over and over again that our heart idols will always let us down. Take money, for instance. Money is a gift from God. It's a good gift from God. And it can be used for glorious purposes. It can be used uh, to provide for our families. It can be used for the sake of being generous, for the sake of showing charity. It can be used for the sake of others. It can be used to promote the spread of the gospel. It can even afford us the opportunities to enjoy other gifts from God. But like so many things that God has given us to be a blessing, money can easily become a glory-stealing idol in our lives. And that's one of the reasons why over and over and over again, the Bible warns us about the dangers of money love. In Proverb eleven, twenty-eight, 28, it says this, Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. In Luke chapter 12, as Jesus tells the parable, he says this. He says that on a particular night, an individual that was confident in his wealth, the the Lord said to him, you fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Or what about James? James, in James chapter 5, verse 5, he says this, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. James doesn't pull punches, does he? Strong, strong warnings. The love of money is a dangerous love. It will lead to disappointment, it will lead to ruin, and as we see in our text, it will lead to ultimate destruction. But on the other hand, learning the key to Christian contentment will not disappoint. Jeremiah Burroughs teaches us that Christian contentment is that sweet and inward quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. You just love the Puritans, right? The way that they can turn a phrase, the way that they can say so much in in such a small amount of time. And that's what we're after. That soul that that has the frame of mind to submit to and to delight in God's wise and fatherly disposal no matter the condition. That's what we're after. And those who desire godliness, they will find it, the Scriptures tell us. But those who desire riches, well, they find ruin. That's what we see in this passage. We see two contrasts, right? This, the covetous and where it leads and the one who desires godliness and where it leads. And so what I want to do is I want to look at this passage backwards. I want to give us the bad news and the warnings first, and then we'll end with the goal of the Christian life. So let's look first at the downfall of the covetous. Look at verse 9 with me. He says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. See, the downfall of the covetous begins with a misplaced desire. A misplaced desire. Paul refers here to those who desire to be rich. And this term for desire, it's it's about like you would expect. A desire is a longing. But it's a kind of longing that leads one to make a plan. I desire a thing. I long to obtain that thing. And so I'm going to come up with a plan so that I can obtain that thing. So it's a, a desire that engages both the heart and the mind. And this is a type of desire that is not necessarily sinful. This is a a natural desire, but it's the kind of desire that can become a consuming interest in a person's life. You connect the heart and the mind, and you go after it in life. That's the first time Paul mentions desire, but it's not the last time. He indicates another type of desire a little bit later in the same verse, where he says that there's a, such a, a desire that is a harmful desire that plunges people into ruin. And this is a different term altogether, and this term is actually much stronger. This desire has become unhealthy. What started out as a healthy longing now has become an unhealthy craving for something that is forbidden. 
This is the type of desire that the Bible helps us to understand is deceitful. It is lustful. It is covetous. This is the term that is used most often in Scripture to describe those human desires that have crossed over from something good to something that is idolatrous. So there's this progression, this negative progression. And then he uses another term that's even further down the line. In verse 10, he uses the term craving. So if you, you see the progression, the downward spiral here is that you have what, something that starts out as a genuine desire that leads to planning can transform into an unhealthy desire that leads to covetousness and it ends up as a craving that is strong enough to lead one to deny the faith. The desire for wealth can become a progressive downward spiral of longing for money at all costs. It leads to the kind of greediness that has no end. It's the kind of desire that is insatiable. No matter how rich this person becomes, he always wants more. No matter how much food or land or pleasure or money this person has, they always want more. This is not simply coveting something that your neighbor has. This is seeking to be satisfied by the things of the world while never believing that what you have is enough. It's a driving influence and interest in a person's heart. Like a sailor adrift at sea who thinks that they can drink some salt water to quench their thirst, the covetous person will continue to drink even though his thirst is never quenched and eventually his drinking will lead to his death. That's the progression that Paul shows us here, the danger of loving money. No sum of money will ever be enough for this craving. And some of the wealthiest men who have ever lived have only confirmed what the Scriptures have told us. John D. Rockefeller, you know that name? He said this one time. He said, uh, I have made many millions, but they have brought me no happiness. The poorest man I know is the man who has nothing but money. The danger of money love begins with a misplaced desire, but that's not where it ends. Look at the end of verse 9. It, it leads to a misstep that plunges us into ruin. Notice the progression that results from the desire. He says, those who desire to be rich fall. There's the misstep. They fall into temptation and into a snare. So it starts with a falling into temptation. The sinful craving to be rich at all costs opens us up to a whole host of temptations. When greed takes over our hearts, the temptations to hoard money, and use it solely for our own pleasure, tend to follow. And I want to go back to what James said to us in James chapter 5, because he, he lists out several ways that a love of money, a dangerous love of money, can lead to the temptations that we see in life. One of the things he mentions is that when we have that, that sinful love of money, we can be tempted to hoard things rather than use them for good. He says this, Your riches have rotted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you, and they will eat your flesh like fire. What is the picture here? The picture is that this is a person who has a lot of things. They have riches, they have garments, they have gold and silver, but they've left those things to rot. They've not even used them. Their garments have been in the back of the closet for so long that they're moth-eaten. Their gold and their silver have begun to corrode. This is someone who has hoarded their goods rather than enjoying them for themselves or using them to do good for others. How many of you are familiar with the A&E television series Hoarders? It has run for 15 seasons and it explores the world of extreme hoarding or what psychologists call compulsive hoarding. Hoarding is defined as a disorder characterized by an excessive acquisition of stuff and an unwillingness to get rid of it. And if I'm stepping on your toes, I'm not sorry. <laughs> One of the things that you will learn if you watch that A&E series is that you don't have to be among the wealthiest in society to have a problem with hoarding. We just want to keep everything. We want to have it there. We never want to get rid of it. What is that? What's going on there? Psychologists want us to see hoarding as a mental disorder. But 
God just declares it to be sin. And it's one of the most common sins of our day. We live in a wildly materialistic culture. And that materialism has just crept into our hearts. And sometimes we don't even see it. In fact, I would say more often than not, we don't see it. We are more apt to see sin, sinful love of money in others than we are to see it in ourselves. We hoard food and money and clothing and trinkets and collectibles and we don't seem to have a good idea of when we have enough nor when it has become too much. We, just we don't see the line. Not only are we tempted to hoard things, but we're also tempted to overindulge in the goods of the world. James again says this, you have lived in, uh, on the earth in luxury. You have lived in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. Again, this is very common in our American materialistic culture, living in luxury. Oh, and by the way, living in luxury and being self-indulgent is somewhat relative, right? So we look at ourselves in this culture and it's, it's kind of easy for us to spot the self-indulgence, the over-the-top self-indulgence in others. It's not that easy for us to see it in ourselves. We compare ourselves to the uber-rich and we think we're fine, but, but go to another country and compare the way we use things, the way we hoard things, the way we indulge in things compared to the way other people do. We don't see it, but I've traveled in different places in this world and it, it's almost like that, that unspoken thing that everybody just knows Americans have this problem except Americans. To indulge in something is just to enjoy it for the sake of the pleasure it brings. A good meal, a nice glass of wine, a quiet evening with your spouse, as Christians, we are right to savor the good things that God has given us to enjoy. And we give God glory for His rich provision when we, th when we thankfully enjoy the things that He has provided. No matter what the Lord has provided, whether it's in plenty or in want, we can show our appreciation for the gifts that God has given us and be thankful and joyful. But to overindulge is to consume these gifts to the point of sinful excess. Too much food becomes gluttony. Too much wine becomes drunkenness. Too much sex becomes immorality. This is the world we live in. Overindulgence. The sinful love of money, and I won't go through everything that James says in James chapter 5, but he says it, it can lead to hoarding. It can lead to sinful self-indulgence. It can lead to murder. It can lead to coveting your neighbor's stuff exploiting the poor, it can lead to cheating on your taxes or lying in business, and so many more things just for the purpose of having more and more stuff. And all of these temptations have the potential to lead us to the next step in Paul's sinful progression. Look at it. He says, first they fall into temptation and then into a snare. It's another word for trap. Traps or snares are hidden, which means we don't see them coming. And let's just be honest, most of us don't see that we have a problem with a love of money. When was the last time you confessed or you heard someone confess to a sinful love of money? I've been in ministry for a long time, and I can say very honestly, I have never had someone come to me and confess, Pastor, I am struggling. I love money too much. Never. It's one of those things where we, we can spot in others, we can't see it in ourselves. It's one of the reasons why Jesus tells us to beware of this type of covetousness and materialism. We need to beware because it sneaks up on us and we don't even realize it. It's all around us. And we just point to the uber-rich as the ones who are having a problem, but we are just as susceptible to a dangerous, sinful love of money as they are. We can allow our money and our stuff to define us and to shape the way we live in this world. And this is where, listen, this is where that temptation turns into a trap. It turns into a snare. Where the fall becomes something that we are entangled in and cannot get out of. And Paul says that this sinful chain reaction of desire leading to temptation that then plunges us into ruin and destruction. That, that's the term he uses, plunges us. And that term plunge gives the idea of you being taken or us being taken and thrown beneath the water and held there. 
beneath the surface that we're plunged into this. So the desire leads to the temptation, and the temptation leads to the fall, and the fall leads to the trap, and the trap leads to us being drowned underneath this sinful desire. It, it's not a joke, and it is very serious. It is a kind of love for money that can lead to our ultimate ruin, but it's also a love that bears all kinds of evil fruit. Look at the next verse. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It can lead us, according to the text, to wander away from the faith. And, and why should we be surprised at that? It was Jesus who said it in Matthew 6. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Straight out of Jesus' mouth. Money can have this godlike grip on our hearts. And I mean godlike in that little g God idol like grip on our hearts. Money is perhaps the most powerful idol in the material world. Men will sell their souls for it. Women will give themselves away for it. And in the end, they have nothing to show. Money has no value in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom that is to come. So Jesus says, don't put your hope in money. Don't give your heart to money. Use money the way God intended it to be used, to care for your most basic needs and then to be a blessing to others. One of the reasons that God has made us as a country and as a people wealthy is so that we can be a conduit of help to others who aren't. Money love can cause us not only to be plunged into this ruin and not only to lead us away from the faith, but he also says it can cause us to pierce ourselves with grief. You see that at the end of the phrase? How many families do you know that have been torn apart by greed or by a lust for money? Someone passes away and they leave an inheritance and now all the kids are fighting over it. This phrase, though, is really bothersome to me because if you notice, it says that there's, we're piercing ourselves. The one driving the dagger into our hearts, guess what? It's us. We pierce ourselves. We drive the stake into our own hearts when we live as though life consists in the abundance of our possessions. Look, I know this is hard. That's why I wanted to start with this and end with the happy talk, right? But we need to be serious about checking our hearts here, looking at our lives here, considering the things that the Scriptures have to say and letting them shine that, that light, that magnifying light upon our own hearts to say, where am I struggling with this? But there is an antidote to this. There is another option here. The downfall of the covetous is one but the key to Christian contentment on the other side, well, that's what we desire. So let's look at the second half or the first half of the verse and the second half of this sermon. And let's look at the key to Christian contentment. Back at verse 6, he says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Contentment. It's a good thing. In and of itself, contentment is a good thing. Being content with what you have, being satisfied with God's provision, that is a good thing. But Paul is not just talking about finding it in our hearts to be content. He's talking about a Christian contentment. He's talking about the pursuit of godliness in our Christian walk and contentment, and he calls it great gain. In other words, there's not a downside here. Being satisfied with what God has provided and pursuing a faithful life to Christ, that's what he's after. So the calling here in, in reaction to the, the pool or the lure of loving money, the call here is to a life of sincere devotion to Christ and to be content with God's provision. And he says that's all the wealth in the world that you'll ever need. It is great gain. So there's three keys here. The first key to Christian contentment starts with a proper mindset. Look back at verse 7. He says, For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. 
insert the joke about you halls at a funeral, right? Right there. This is just a fundamental truth of the human experience. And Job recognized this long ago. Do you remember what Job had to say? He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He understood this a long ago. This is a consistent principle, not only throughout Scripture, but in all of human experience. Our entry into this world and our exit from this world are the same. The stuff that we treasure today will be sold off in garage sales after we're gone. Because we can't take it with us. And between these two events, birth and death, all this stuff comes and goes. We understand that. And part of that is a mindset. If we can adopt this basic mindset that possessions are only the tools of life, not the meaning of life, then we can learn to live for things that truly matter in this world and beyond. And that's what he's after. That's what we're after. This perspective should influence the way we live our lives in every way. So, a couple of questions. What's more important? Giving your children everything they want or giving them the things they need along with love and the truth of Christ? Moms and dads, that's a tough question. Actually, it may be a tough question. Maybe not. But the answer is simple. If you want to pursue Christ in the way you love and lead and guide your children, you work hard to give them the basic things that they need and give them as much love as you can and point them to Christ and put the kindling of the gospel around their hearts. Paul wants us to place our life in proper perspective. The things of this earth are temporal, not eternal. Money and possessions are temporal, but our souls are eternal. So invest in your soul. Set your mind on storing up treasure in heaven to use Christ's words. So it starts with a mindset, but that's not where it ends. The second key to Christian contentment relies on a proper attitude. Verse 8, but if we have food and clothing, the basic necessities of life, with these things we can be content. Paul is not promoting poverty here. Um, there's actually some interesting things that he does with this language that would have us to understand that he's not just talking about food and clothing, but also included in that it would be shelter because that's where food and clothing are kept. So, but he's saying this, if we have these things, the basic necessities of life, we should be content there. Food and clothing and shelter are essential for our time on earth. It's not wrong to want these things. He's not promoting an aesthetic view of uh, Christian poverty. What he's saying is these are the basic necessities of life. And if we have those, we should learn contentment there. He's also helped us to understand a couple of other things about God's desire to be gracious toward his people. In verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 4, he says, Everything created by God is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. That's a, a, a reminder that all of the things that we have are gifts from God. We should receive them with joy and gratitude. And then Later in this very chapter, he is going to say that God richly provides for us everything to enjoy. Richly provides. So he's not calling on this aesthetic view of poverty or enforced poverty that some Christian traditions hold to. That's not what he's after at all. He is trying to push us toward being content with what we have. But he does say, God richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So what does that mean? We should enjoy the things that God provides and be satisfied with those things. Be content with those things. We should not take the simple life for granted, nor should we assume that a simple life is undesirable. Paul actually tells the church to desire to live a simple and quiet life in Christ Jesus. And there's something about the kind of the rat race mentality of Dallas that just causes us to strive for more and more and more and more in an insatiable kind of way. And we need to be on guard against that. The American mindset toward material wealth and prosperity can very easily produce covetousness, but the biblical outlook on life promotes a settled satisfaction in the Lord's provision. And that's what we're after. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus helps us to have this proper attitude toward the basic necessities of life. Here's what he says. He says, don't be anxious about your life. 
Don't be anxious about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or about your body or what you're going to wear. Isn't life about more than food and the body about more than clothing? I mean, look at the birds, he says. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. See, what starts out with a proper mindset becomes a proper attitude. And that should be our proper attitude. Not to be anxious, but to trust the Lord and to seek His kingdom and righteousness. And then last, the third key to Christian contentment is to have the proper goal. And this goes all the way back to verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You see, godliness is the goal. Christ-likeness is the goal. What does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? It means to strive to be faithful to Christ and His Word, to trust in Him and His provision upon the cross, and to have a life that is devoted to a pursuit of Him. That is godliness that promotes contentment and is great gain. And the pursuit of godliness, we need to add to that this contentment in our heart, a a satisfaction in what the Lord has provided no matter the circumstances. Paul says, if this is yours, you will have great gain. In other words, all the wealth that a Christian needs. I know this is a challenging passage. This is a challenging concept for us because it takes the mindset that we're accustomed to and it just turns it around and says, no, you need to look at this differently. Pursue godliness with contentment, not the wealth of this world that will betray you. One commentator put it like this. He says, godliness is not about acquiring better and more material things. It is instead an active life of faith, a living out of covenant faithfulness in relation to God that finds sufficiency and contentment in Christ alone, no matter our outward circumstances. So let me conclude with some final thoughts. Those who desire riches find ruin, and those who desire godliness find contentment. So which way will you choose? The scriptures are clear. What is your pursuit? Money can buy you a bed but not sleep. It can buy you books but not brains. It can buy you food but not appetite. It can buy you finery but not beauty. It can buy you a house but not a home. It can buy you medicine but not health. It can buy you luxuries but not culture. Amusements but not happiness. Religion but not salvation. It can give you a passport to everywhere but heaven. What's your end goal? That's going to determine the pursuit of your life. Jesus taught a parable in Luke 12. We've already mentioned it a little bit. It was a parable about a man who had great wealth. And this man had so much that he sold all that he had to build this large storehouse so that he could keep all of his stuff in it for the rest of his life. And he convinced himself that he had everything that he would ever need. So he decided to build these big barns, put all of his stuff in it, and to relax and eat and drink and be merry And the Lord calls him a fool. He called him a fool because as soon as his barns were full of all of the stuff, his soul was required of him, which is a euphemism for dying. He died. He couldn't take it with him. And all of his earthly stuff had no value in the kingdom to come. And so Jesus says this, What will it profit a man to gain the whole world while forfeiting his soul? You see, our souls require a Savior. And the Gospel tells us that Jesus laid down His life to save our souls from judgment, not our bank accounts from bankruptcy. The Gospel tells us that Jesus laid aside the riches of heaven, that He came to earth to take our sin upon His shoulders, and He died to pay our ransom. He did this to make us His treasured people. And in response, we must learn to treasure Christ 
above all the money in the world. So let me pray and ask the Lord to do that for us. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for the challenges that we face in your word and the reminders that we have in it. And I thank you for these times where you are not content to just allow us to live in the blindness of the sins of our culture, but you show us your word to call us out of that. And so, Lord, today, as, a, as I, I've attempted to preach your word faithfully, Lord, I pray that you would pierce our hearts where we need to be pierced, that you would show us where we have given our love to material wealth, where we have placed our security in our bank accounts, where we have loved money in a sinful and dangerous way, and would you call us to a type of repentance that is consistent with your word. Call us to be a people who understand that money is a gift to be used for your glory and not just for our security here on earth. You have blessed us abundantly. Let us enjoy the, the things that you have given us, but let us also be a conduit of blessing to others. And Lord, I pray that you would accomplish your purpose in this, that you would convict our hearts and that you would steer our hearts and minds and lives in a direction of pursuing godliness and being content. So would you do that for us? Would you help us to seek first your kingdom? Would you help us to desire above all things to live a faithful life of following after Christ, of trusting in him and of desiring to be faithful to him and to make him known? Would you use us for that purpose? And let us know with a contented heart that pursuing that is great gain. We love you and thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.